The year is 2003. Apple has just launched iTunes. Arnie returns as the Terminator and then becomes the governor of California. The US invades Iraq. The highly infectious disease SARS coronavirus spreads from China. Wait, what? Oh yeah, we've had two of those. And Rockstar North is coming off of two back-to-back -back home runs with Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City. The entire industry of gaming is paying attention now. What will they do next? Well, how do you follow up such insane success? Most companies at this stage would play it safe, especially since the aforementioned titles came with their fair share of controversy. Not Rockstar. They went ahead and made their most notorious game yet and probably one of the most controversial games of all time. A ruthless tale of violence, corruption and brutality. Just an unapologetic and unhinged survival horror experience. So I thought it'd be fun to revisit this classic and explore the vile corners of Carcer City once more. In this video, we will go through the plot, check out some of the cut content and look at the legacy left behind by Rockstar North's most gruesome and frankly speaking most f***ed up title to date. Okay, are you ready? Camera, action! The game starts with a newscast report on James Earl Cash, a death row inmate that was supposedly recently executed by lethal injection. As it turns out, Cash was only sedated and awakens to the voice of a man introducing himself only as the director. His offer is straightforward, survival and freedom in exchange for vicious slaughter of various gang members that are out on the hunt for him on the streets of Carson City, all while being filmed on CCTV and directed through an earpiece by the mysterious man. With that brief introduction we are dropped into the first scene where Cash is instructed to kill this dumb f Mr. Dumbfuck is a member of the Hoods, a group comprising of low-level criminals and corrupt off-duty cops. As bad as these guys sound, they're actually pretty mellow compared to the rest of the gangs we're about to meet. Cash doesn't seem to mind obliging the director's wishes as he executes these dudes in brutal fashion. I can tell he has some experience. So we did as the voice in our ear asked, but he does not intend to set us free quite yet. We get abducted by the Cerberus, a private militia acting as the director's personal security unit. They take us to the next destination and thus we embark on the longest night of James Earl Cash's troubled life. From here on, the Cerberus keeps coming back each time Cash has fulfilled his role and take him to various abandoned parts of Carson City, where he encounters numerous gangs he has to kill along the way. It's a simple premise. The game plays out during that one insane night as you do whatever it takes for your freedom. The storytelling is conveyed via short cutscenes between the chapters and there's not much more to it. Simple and effective. The gameplay is also quite simple. It's a stealth based survival horror game so you'll do a lot of sneaking and creeping in the shadows as you lure in your prey by smacking the wall or throwing objects such as bricks, cans and bottles. If the enemies hear you they come out looking for you and it's genuinely creepy. You'll have to sneak up behind them to perform the executions which come in three stages for each weapon. Hasty, violent and gruesome. They get more ferocious the longer you hold down the button. After the kill, it's best to hide the body if you can so that the other hunters don't get alerted. There is face to face fighting too but this is not encouraged and you're only forced to do it on two occasions in the entire game as a tutorial for the mechanics. It's really a last resort type of deal and it's a good way to get your ass handed to you, especially if you're outnumbered. And the best thing to do if you're spotted is to run away and lose the pursuers. Early in the game you'll have access to a wide variety of melee weapons such as crowbars, baseball bats and knives. Sometimes you'll have to use disposable items like plastic bags, glass shards and wires. As you advance through the game you'll get firearms as well but we'll get to that in a moment. Anyway after dealing with the hoods, Cash runs into several other gangs, each more f***ed up than the last. At an abandoned junkyard we meet a gang of white supremacists called the Skins. After that we meet the War Dogs, a group of army veterans and skilled huntsmen run by the ever intimidating Ramirez, who is also responsible for organizing the rest of the gangs. This section plays out at an abandoned zoo where the War Dogs have kidnapped members of Cash's family and will execute them one at a time each time he's spotted. So it's especially important to stay well hidden during this scene if you want to rescue his family, something I wasn't awfully successful at unfortunately. 
Following that chapter, Cash faces off against the innocents in an abandoned mall. They consist of Satanists and mentally disturbed sexual deviants, also known as Scullies and Babyfaces. This is the first chapter where you're primarily using firearms. Quick thoughts on the gunplay. I've seen some people complain about it and while I totally get why, I find myself strangely enjoying the shootouts. Once you get used to the mechanics that for the most part don't make any sense, it's oddly satisfying blasting people's heads off and watching the brain matter splatter all over the place. Furthermore, I like how you have to be super careful as you can and will get gunned down by just a few devastating shots, which made the game quite challenging at times, especially towards the end. At the conclusion of the mall section, Cash is instructed to watch a videotape that the director claims he will appreciate. On the tape, he sees one of his family members get murdered by the innocents. Cash is by no means a good person. He was, after all, on death row when we first met him, and doesn't seem to display any signs of remorse butchering all these degenerates. Yet here we do see him show some emotion and signs of empathy, implying, at the very least, that he isn't a complete psychopath. It's at this point that Cash's main motivation turns from survival to revenge. To add insult to injury, next Cash is reduced to guiding and protecting a drunken hobo across the dark and rainy streets of East Los Albos. The streets lead us to a graveyard, after which we arrive at a chemical factory where Cash dispatches of the last members of the innocents. Shortly thereafter, we reach a mental asylum taken over by a group of schizophrenic psychotics known as the Smileys. This manager also visited the Darkwoods Penitentiary, which hosts more than a thousand inmates from all over the country. The prison's modern facilities include spacious cells for the inmates. The exceptionally well-staffed hospital is equipped for emergencies, as well as routine health checks. Adjacent to row one, the electric chair room, is where death sentences are carried out. Here, we're instructed to follow the white rabbit as it leads us to several traps throughout the asylum. The end of this scene was meant to be the climax of the director's snuff film, as Cash was not meant to survive the final ambush. Nevertheless, he does survive, subsequently killing the White Rabbit as well as the attacking members of Cerberus sent in to finish him off. From here on, you no longer get instructions from the director as you're now officially working off script. Additionally, the use of firearms is much more prevalent from here on, which makes sense from the standpoint of the storyline as Cash is no longer required to kill in barbaric ways. In the next section, the remaining members of the War Dogs, led by Ramirez, are hired to stop Cash from advancing any further. Ramirez actually caught him, but decided to let him go so that his men could hunt him down instead. However, this proved to be a crucial mistake on his part, as they fail in their attempt, and Cash kills all of them, including Ramirez. As Cash desperately attempts to make his escape, the journalist from the beginning of the game picks him up. She reveals the identity of the director, an ex-filmmaker from Los Santos named Lionel Starkweather, and shares her plans to expose his snuff film ring and the corruption of the Carcer City Police Department. Let's quickly talk about Starkweather. He was once a successful director in Vinewood, but was ultimately exiled as his movies started to flop. Filled with resentment and hate, he moved to Carcer City where he developed a perverted obsession with violence. That eventually led to the production of snuff films and other underground projects. As his empire grew, he started hiring local criminals and other deviants, and even employed a powerful group of mercenaries mentioned earlier. His production company Valiant Video Enterprises made him filthy rich and now he just hides away in his castle and gets off to morbid acts of violence. To give you an idea how twisted and psychopathically vengeful he is, he produced a film collection titled The Director's Cut in which he kidnapped the people responsible for his Vinewood downfall and murdered them in cold blood. He's clearly a complete nutcase and lacks any feelings of empathy or guilt. Throughout the game, you'll hear him get very impatient with Cash if he sits around in the shadows for too long. He'll demand gore and will occasionally get... Uh, excited at some of the more despicable acts Cash is forced to perform. Oh my god, I've had an accident. I'm serious, man. You brought me off. Motivated by the worst possible of human impulses, he will lie, manipulate and deceive to get the most cruel and sadistic outcome imaginable. To put it simply, I would define Lionel Starkweather as one of the most disgusting, merciless and vile antagonists of all time. And that's exactly what makes him a brilliant character. Brian Cox did a phenomenal job voicing him. You really do want to find this piece of shit and do bad things to him. What? Thank you, fuck. Oh, shut up and get some of your boys to take care of it. Don't file the arrest report. Don't kill him either. Send both to me. Hey, 
Remember who you're talking to, you son. Listen, you fuck, it's your job to clean up this city's mess. That's what you get paid for. Anyway, back to the plot. Cash and the journalist arrive to the neighborhood where she lives to retrieve a dossier of evidence she has been collecting. We protect her from the corrupt police officers and upon reaching the apartment tell her to leave the city immediately, as Cash goes after Starkweather. He is pursued by the cops and the SWAT down the subway and then gets cornered in a train yard where he is almost executed, but gets narrowly rescued by the Cerberus. They bring him to Starkweather estate to execute him themselves. And if you thought this story can't get any wilder, get a load of this. Shit. They get distracted by a man who calls himself Pixie. Pixie is a deranged, chainsaw-wielding, possibly mentally challenged, obese, naked man who wears a pig's head as a mask. He was kept in chains in the attic of Starkweather's mansion and was fed with the remains of corpses from the snuff films. That's right, on top of everything he was also a cannibal. Pixie used to be Lionel's main star attraction, having been a part of big hits such as Pixie's greatest hits and Pixie's bloopers. Over time, however, his mental state deteriorated. He became more animalistic and unpredictable in his behavior, forcing Starkweather to lock him up in chains and keep him captive in his attic. Luckily for Cash, Pixie breaks free of his chains and escapes, giving our anti-hero a chance to avoid being executed and work his way past the garden and eventually through the mansion, where he kills a shitload of Cerberus members, including their leader, ultimately reaching the attic. The attic is absolutely repulsive. You can almost smell the stench through the screen. Here, Cash and Pigsy play a game of hide and seek as they hunt each other. We attack from the shadows until finally Pigsy has had enough and in the fear of his life escapes to the upper floor, outside Starkweather's office. After luring Pigsy on a metal grate that collapses under his weight, Cash delivers one more slice and puts him out of his misery. In desperation, the cowardly director sends out the last of his guards, but equipped with the chainsaw, Cash makes quick work of them. At last, it's time to confront this monster. He doesn't put up much of a fight and his pleas for mercy are futile as Cash guts him like a pig and deals out a final blow through the head. Cash, I made you! Now that's a money shot if I ever seen one. The game ends with the journalist exposing the snuff ring and the corruption within CCPD, resulting in the arrest of the police chief Gary Schaefer. James Earl Cash's fate is left ambiguous as he is nowhere to be found. There's one interesting character that we never even got to encounter during the game. We know of his existence through the instructional manual that was presented as a catalog for the snuff film production company, Valiant Video Enterprises. He calls himself Mr. Nasty and he is the anonymous financial backer and producer of Starkweather's films. The catalog links to a website supposedly run by Mr. Nasty. It used to be a promotional page for the game designed to look like an online shop for members to purchase all sorts of things, like the snuff films, gimp masks and even weapons. The website domain is now acquired by a fan and is turned into a petition for Manhunt 3. So make sure you drop in and sign the thing if you're also down for a sequel. Mr. Nasty is the most mysterious character from the Manhunt lore and I'd love to see a third game featuring him as the main antagonist. I mean, it's true. Butcher them, Cash! Cut them up! Beat them down and choke the fucking life out of them! Before we move on, let's briefly go over some of the cut content. Let's start with Cash himself, who looked significantly different in the better stages of development. He appears to have had bigger muscles, facial hair and a different outfit. Kinda resembles Max Payne from the third game. Pigsy went through some redesigns as well as you can see here. He was a little bit cuter with a hairier back. Furthermore, the game initially had a few more gangs that didn't make it into the retail version. The Clowns was a gang of mentally ill men that wore clown makeup, hopped up on amphetamines and other stimulants that would shout and laugh hysterically as they hunt you. If you look at the top right clown, you can see a striking resemblance to a real life serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, when he wore his makeup as Pogo the Clown. Interestingly, the sponsor in the bio is listed as James W. Gacy. The last clown on the bottom right seems to be a nod to Oliver Hardy, an actor from the iconic comedy duo Laurel and Hardy. The cam heads were also cut, though not much is known about them at all. We don't even know if they had actual cameras for heads, even though it looks like it from the concept art. 
That does seem unlikely since neither this game nor the GTA 3D universe games, which Manon shares the universe with, are known for supernatural beings. Shut up, sit down, relax. There's no bio on these guys either, but a lot of their concepts, like the hockey mask, were adapted into the skins. It's safe to assume that they gradually morphed into the skins during development. The Lost was a gang described as a... No, not them. The Lost was a gang described as the former rulers of the scrapyard. It was a bunch of homeless lunatics that wore makeshift armor salvaged from their environment. They were led by another cut character known as Binbag, who was fitted with trash bags and barbed wire, and his weapons of choice were the two rusty blades we can see here on the concept art. The monkeys did make it into the final game, but only appear in the bonus mission called Monkey See, Monkey Die. Another bunch of crazies wearing monkey suits and making monkey sounds. And finally we have the Scarecrow. His real name is Kenneth Jesperson and he was the former leader of the Smileys. Presumably he is the tramp we protect in the main game. When he puts on his mask, he remembers the good times with the Smileys and turns into a psychotic, axe-wielding murderer. He's named after Keith Hunter Jesperson, who was a serial killer known as the Happy Face Killer, because he drew smileys on the letters he sent to the authorities and the media. Plenty weapons didn't make the cut either, like the fire axe and katana. On some of the artwork, you can see the hunters wielding cut weapons like the PSG-1 and silent sniper rifles. A few of the cut weapons can be accessed in the game with the help of glitches, for example the ice pick and the spiked bat. There were more changes made to the game that we won't go into here, as I'm pretty sure I've covered the most noteworthy ones. But if you want more detailed information on all of the cut content, check out Wikihunt. Link is in the description. Unsurprisingly, a game where the main gameplay mechanic is the ruthless execution of enemies will garner some controversy. Even Rockstar themselves were divided over this game, and part of the company wanted nothing to do with it. Former Rockstar employee Jeff Williams shares on his blog, It may sound surprising, but there was almost a mutiny at the company over that game. It was Rockstar North's pet project. Most of us at Rockstar Games wanted no part of it. He goes on to explain that Manon just made us all feel icky. It was all about the violence and it was realistic violence. We all knew there was no way we could explain that game. There was no way to rationalize it. We were crossing the line. Shortly after its release, Manhunt was straight up banned in New Zealand and Australia. There were also debates in a few other countries on whether or not it should be restricted to adults. In 2004, the game was linked to a murder in the UK, after initial media reports wrongfully claimed that the police found a copy of Manhunt in the perpetrator's room. The police released an official statement denying any link, claiming it was a drug-related robbery, and noting that the game was found in the victim's bedroom and not the offender's. Activist and disbarred lawyer Jack Thompson said he wrote a letter to Rockstar, warning them that somebody was going to copycat the Manhunt game and kill somebody. The victim's family hired Thompson with the aim to sue Sony and Rockstar, but the case was dropped soon after. Yeah, the game was controversial to say the least. Personally, I don't believe that there should in any way be more limitations set on video games than any other form of art. We see all kinds of crazy shit in movies, but video games usually get the most heat for some reason. I guess it's because kids play games and you're controlling the action, but we have established a content rating system for a reason. Besides, I just don't buy the narrative that a video game can make a sane person go out and do harm any more than a movie can. There would certainly have to be other aspects of their life that have contributed to that sort of behavior, way more than simply playing a game. Critical reception was for the most part positive though. GameSpot and IGN both rated the game an 8.3 out of 10. The Chicago Tribune had this to say, Manhunt is easily the most violent game ever made. It will likely be dismissed by many as a disgusting murder simulator with no reason to exist. But Manhunt also is the clockwork orange of video games, holding your eyes open so as to not miss a single splatter, asking you, is this really what you enjoy watching? Had Manhunt been poorly made using the snuff film angle as a cheap gimmick, the game would have been shameful and exploitative. What elevates it to a grotesque, chilling work of art is both presentation and gameplay. Manhunt is solid as a game. It's engaging to use stealth as you creep through the shadows of this wicked city, using your smarts to avoid death while dishing out much of your own. I think this guy hits the nail on the head. Yes, this game is telling a disturbing tale. Sadly, this stuff actually occurs in the real world and this is an artistic portrayal of that. You can't tell this story without emphasizing the violence and brutality of it all. But at the end of the day, it is just a game. 
and it's a well-made game that's intended for mature audiences that want to experience something unique. Game Informer has called it a dark, underappreciated masterpiece, and it took the 85th spot on IGN's Top 100 PlayStation 2 games list. And nearly two decades later, Madhon still has a lot of cult following. Why the need for so much gruesome graphic violence? Why not let us imagine Because it's a little so bit? much fun, Jan! Get it! Oh, really? Nice cash. Nice. I tried to play this game once when I was a kid and it scared the shit out of me. I just couldn't do it. Hearing Cash's rapid heartbeat as your foes get closer, not to mention the insults and threats they throw at you while searching for you. It's really great stuff, but too much for my then 13 year old brain to handle. Especially when you're spotted and they start chasing you. The music picks up and they yell like maniacs as you desperately try to evade them. It'll make your hands sweat for sure. To this day, I can't bring myself to play it on hardcore. No thanks, I'll stick to the fetish mode. By the way, how creative are these names for the difficulty levels? Even the way the main menu looks and the instructions you get when adjusting the brightness level, all of it is designed perfectly to contribute to the sick and twisted atmosphere the game is going for. Speaking of the atmosphere, it's utterly haunting. Most of the game is set in dark, filthy, abandoned locations and there's this undeniable sense of hopelessness. Because of the technical limitations of the time, the maps look pretty empty and lack detail. But oddly enough, this adds to the creepiness factor of the game. The soundtrack is absolutely incredible and sets the tone flawlessly. The music will pick up as your foes get suspicious and kicks into high gear when you're spotted. It really is superb. If you play the game with a microphone connected, you can use your voice to distract enemies and you'll have to watch the noise you make if they're close by, adding an extra element of immersion and suspense. I wonder if a game like this would be possible today, with the world becoming increasingly sensitive and the borders of political correctness narrowing by the day. Kinda doubt it. I mean, we're talking about a game where the protagonist can decapitate his adversaries and throw their heads around as projectiles. Mmm, I don't know. In the rather janky renderware engine, they might get away with that, but I'm not sure that would slide today. For what it's worth, I'm totally on board for a Manhunt 3 in the Rage engine with Euphoria physics. Yeah, that's wishful thinking. Instead, we're getting GTA 5 for a decade straight. Rockstar, you changed, man. Question, what do you think about Manhunt? Is it too violent? Does it cross a line that games shouldn't cross? I'd love to know what you guys think about the game, so let me know in the comments below. And hey, thanks for watching. <laughs>